So we can start. And um, Bob, I'm assuming you are not here for general public comment, so I can pass that agenda item unless you wish to make Yes, it. I'm here to answer any questions that you might have on expedited. Okay. Um, <laughs> Chair's report. Uh, so our recommendations went forward to the council. Um, as I've just been telling Brian, I was not able to attend the first meeting as I was attending to a, a cost to sign, but, um, but Sarah went and if you have specific questions, there were, um, there were some questions I had already communicated with Jesse Adams around several of the issues he had. And we had a phone conversation where he had all of our resolutions, put those resolutions in front of him, and he asked me questions about those. Um, the second time around, I called him and before the second meeting, asked him whether there were any issues that he felt needed to be addressed, any additional documents that we could provide information. Um, he never called me back. Sarah said that the second meeting, um, there was no discussion, that they would pass without, without any real discussion in the second meeting. So they are all approved as of right now. Um, Sarah mentioned to me that the housing partnership in crafting their request, um, when, when you look at the wording of the act, there's the issue about owning or operating um, community housing, which in reading it again, I thought that applied to if you give cash assistance, it either has to go directly to the individuals, or you can route that cash assistance through the organization, and that that owning or operating community housing does not apply to the general support clause. And I don't know whether we established that, but I think that even if they were to, let's say, give it to community legal services, which obviously does not own or operate housing, I think it would still be permissible under the action so uh, so they they're not they're not sure they're going to do the RFP obviously they'll be open to organizations that do own or operate but it might be might go to an organization that's not so I just wanted to flag that for you because um, the housing partnership came back and asked that question whether that would be an issue um, the resolution that went to council does not specify that it has to go through I'm sure we discussed it in the minutes well, I think when we initially looked at the eligibility form, the question was, my reading at that point was that that owner-operate language applied, and so that they needed to come up with an organization that did owner-operate community housing. But when I looked at it again, I don't think that's true. I think that the support language just says you are supporting community housing, and it's pretty much... <coughs> But it was revised with less wide open. And is that our purview to decide? We are the interpreter of the statute until we're sued. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's really, you know, that's, you know CBC, CBCs are or, or challenged by DOR. Okay. So, you know, this, there, have been, you know, there have been suits against CPCs or against cities where a citizen decides it's not consistent with the with the Preservation Act. You know, we would typically look to the solicitor, and we have looked to the solicitor before for clarification, but the solicitor's opinion is only advisory. And occasionally the DOR will issue a letter, and then we tend to abide by that. I was under the impression that your interpretation of that language is that it included the including but not the to kind of phrase, and that was, that, that's why you thought it would be more expansive. Not that the language is better. Owning or operating in the pie and specifically the original product. Um, Sarah, is this where we can go to uh, what's his name, Boston? That they're really just advisory. They'll they'll say here are some other similar projects, but you need to you need to follow up either with the or with your own solicitor. Well, but they also are part of the drafting exercise for those yes, amendments, so they correct. might know in terms of the legislative intent behind the last minute changes to that. Well, the, the, you know, the language, when you look at the language, support of community housing shall include, but not be limited to, programs that provide grants, loans, rental assistance, security deposits, interest rate write downs, or other forms of assistance directly to individuals and families who are eligible for community housing or to an entity that owns, operates. So that's, that means that the entity that owns or operated is within the two 
phrase. So that means you're providing assistance to the individual's organ, to, right? But if you go back to the beginning, it shall include but not be limited to programs. Right. That's what, so, that's yeah. what I'm saying. So, because that's what you explained last time, and I agree right. with you, which yeah. is different than saying that that last word just doesn't apply at all to who the recipient is. It's just, it could be more than just programs, either of those two types of things. Well, see, provide grants. I think that's, I think that it actually says that you can have programs that go further than provide grants. Right. Well, that's not so, yeah. right. so that's right. So it's just that we agree that it can be interpreted more broadly. Yes. 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 Yep. That, that is, is wide open. So I don't I don't see that as um, a significant issue at this part, but obviously that will update us as they go forward with drafting the proposal. Um, then we have approval of minutes from November 20th, 2013, January 15th, 2014, and April 2nd. 2014. Uh, Devin has not found any typographical errors. Ooh, no, I'm sure. mm -hmm. I tried. Um, <clears throat> Gabe submitted comments. As Dave has wanted to do. Okay, which were right, all reflecting things that I. Yes. Um, and. So um, we could take those as a group if someone makes the point to make a motion to approve. I would approve the set of minutes presented to us. Is there a second? Second. I have to approve the set of minutes presented to us. is the expedited, expedited funding request. So this is, um, this is basically a preliminary vote on whether or not we will hear an expedited funding request. This is not a, a vote on the matter itself. Um, but Bob Zimmerman is here for Broadbrook Coalition. And Bob, do you want to present to us what you're thinking? Sure. As you probably know, we've been uh, working for five or six years now on trying to get rid of major infestations of invasive plants in this general life conservation area. And this has involved both a lot of volunteer work and also work by um, um, people with a technical um, permission to use herbicides to uh, try to get rid of a number of different kinds of, of uh, invasive plants. And one of our targets uh, has been Phragmites australis in the marsh, the uh, rubber marsh below the dam. And uh, about four years ago, we <coughs> had an application uh, which was approved before the CBC to uh, fund the removal of uh, three stands of fragments, uh, which is a, a very uh, uh, aggressive invasive plant in wet and marshy areas. And uh, we obtained funding to uh, control and eliminate, if possible, those three stands of fragments, which has gone very well. Uh, one is almost, uh, as far as we can tell, completely gone, and the other two are greatly suppressed, and we continue working on them every year. And a year or so ago, we noticed that there was another patch of Phragmites further down the broad road in an area that um, we really only became um, aware of after the city purchased the so-called Broad Road Gap parcel because it gave us access to the part of the road that we hadn't uh, really been in touch with before. And we noticed, we counted about two dozen strands of Phragmites, um, I think that was two years ago. And um, last summer it had obviously gotten a lot worse, and um, Chris Colleton, who is the uh, uh, ecological services guy, the uh, herbicide applicator who we've used a lot, actually went in and told us it was much worse than even we thought at that point, and it was covering almost an acre. So it's expanding rapidly. It's uh, within the confines of the of the conservation area. It's just upstream from a place where dwarf wedge mussel, an endangered species in Massachusetts, has been found. 
we are hoping that it hasn't spread further down the stream, but we're very eager as part of our program of getting rid of invasive plants in, in Costa Rica to get after that stand of Phragmites. And uh, Chris Politan uh, has been in and made us an estimate of $2,400, which is in our application, um, to <coughs> treat it, treat the stand of Phragmites this summer. Uh, he'll go in uh, if we uh, have the funding to uh, uh, to pay for this to cut the Phragmites in June and uh, then go in later um, in August or September to actually use herbicide to control the, the residue of the plants. And it's just a lot easier, <coughs> excuse me, a lot easier to treat them if they're cut first. So the cutting in June is an important part of the project, and that will make it a little easier to apply the herbicide later in the, later in the summer as the plants are sort of drawing the nutrients down to the root systems. So that's pretty much the project. It's one stand of Phragmites, um, the fourth that was discovered, and um, with the success that we've had with the three stands of Phragmites that we've been um, trying to control over the last three or four years, I think there's a very good chance of eliminating, or nearly eliminating, this, uh, this stand of Phragmites as well. So that's pretty much it. How sure are you that you've identified them? I mean, this one kind of surprised you on the scale of it's bigger, and I understand it's because we expanded the, uh -huh. the area, so I get that, but how um, how sure are you that you know where you want to It's very them? easy to identify, actually. It grows on long stalks. Um, in this part of the country, they get up to eight or nine feet, and they have tassels on the end. So you can spot them from quite a distance away, so uh, that's how we initially found found them, found this particular stand. But it was a, a area that was hard to get to, and we didn't really know the extent of it until Politan was able to go in and evaluate it for us. Who would bother with from 20 stems to an acre in two years? It seems incredible, doesn't it? Wow. No, two, in two years, yeah. Two, two years from 20 stems yeah. to a... Well, our, our initial view of it was essentially with binoculars across the marsh. And uh, it could have been that, you know, we just didn't uh, understand how big the growth was. But certainly of the easily visible uh, stalks, at one, yeah, I, I counted 24 <laughs> one time. But I was, I was surprised, actually, that Chris thinks it's covered as much as 29 acres. And it's round? It's a rodeo? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a... That's a uh, uh, a version of the herbicide glyphosate that's been designed for uh, use in wetland areas. Where is it? Where is it located? Is it, it's in the wetlands complex. That's the large wetlands complex where the brook narrows down right near the gap parcel. Is that? Yeah, it's. Um, let's see how, how I can describe it. The um, the marsh extends north. Mm -hmm. uh, with a gap parcel on one side and the older existing industrial lake on the other side. And that gets to a point, it makes the stream makes an almost right angle turn to the east or northeast. And it's right, it's right in that area. It's a, it's a very hard area to get to. Um, uh, really, finally, had to go over uh, with permission to, to go over somebody's private property. And do you have a sense of, was that a dis disturbed area, or was that from the... I know that there have been beaver ponds there, and the water level has fluctuated greatly in the past right. six, seven years. Do you have a sense of why that was hospitable to... I don't, I don't really... I, I haven't actually been to the exact spot yeah. myself where it's growing. But I suspect with uh, the three stands of Phragmites that I mentioned earlier upstream, mm -hmm. um, it's fairly easy if, uh, you know, a... Uh, um, uh, stem or some stems of the fragmentaries broke off in one of those other stands that could have eventually led to the proliferation of, uh, of this new stand. Mm -hmm. David? Um, well, do you have a question? Because I was going to make a motion. Speak up. Uh, I pulled up a. I know we don't have it up here. Can you just indicate where it is? Oh, sure. <coughs> yeah. 
right. What? Alright, I'm trying to zoom in. It's right there when the bug was picked up. Framing it that way, because I don't—I'm not trying to lead you into that, but I can see that this is a continuing problem, and I, I don't. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> no, I, I certainly understand. And uh, the um, what 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 I would use as a good example of um, how we can control patches of fragments like this is the success that polypen and we have had in controlling the upstream three patches. And of those, one seems to be completely eradicated, okay. which is pretty amazing for fragmented. The other two, we get a little bit of respout in the summer, but uh, Politan uh, has agreed to continue treating those for as long as it takes to... Well, and I guess that's what I'm thinking in this case. This area you're describing is hard to get to. Mm -hmm. It's You haven't seen it. It's bigger. And he's giving you an estimate based on having haven't gone there. And yes. And I would think we'd, it'd be prudent to have him go back and look at it later. You know, he's going to have to tr he's going to have to cut it. Mm -hmm. He's going to have to treat it. And then has he priced in going back and assessing where we were? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> his uh, his program is a three year program, and that's proved pretty pretty adequate for the other patches of fragmites we've, we've dealt with. And when you said you have access across private land, is that crossing the Bollinger's? That was crossing the Bollinger's. Uh, Chris actually talked with, uh, with Bobby Bollinger last, last summer in the range to be able to use his woods roads to get down there. So, so the 2400 is years. Yeah, most of it's in the first year. Right. The uh, subsequent, you know, it just seems so three. reasonable. Pardon me? <laughs> seems so reasonable. <laughs> I mean, an acre. Yeah. They cut and then they can't. Any Paints every stem? Well, in areas where the Phragmites is a, is, is a monoculture, where it's fairly dense and only Phragmites, uh, he feels quite comfortable about using backpack sprayers in those areas. But around the periphery, it tends to be mixed in with some native vegetation. So it's around the periphery that he cuts. Um, well, he'll cut all of this this summer, but uh, then he actually applies um, the uh, herbicide directly to each plant. Mm -hmm. and either inject it in or uh, there's another approach called bloody glove where you uh, essentially soak your glove in the herbicide and uh, sort of stroke it. Dave, do you want to make a motion? Well, my impression is that we're getting a lot into these questions that are of the type that would be appropriate for a discussion of the merits of the of the request rather than the merits of a request for expedition um, or expediting. So uh, just to the question before us of whether to expedite this and on the grounds that we've been presented with of uh, uh, this being a project that has very distinct uh, imminent timetable uh, of a very, very short duration and that this also is a project that we use history we know and we have endorsed in the past. I would I would uh, like to move that we uh, consider this as uh, well, but I will review. Is there a second? Second by Dave. So before discussion, uh, know that Sarah emailed us all the piece of our plan, Appendix E, that deals with our policy regarding expedited review. So in doing this, 
it's, we need to determine it's necessary for successful project completion. It's, of course, the goal established in the CPC plan, and that we will make the determination of considering the following questions. When is the commitment needed and why? When is disbursement needed and why? And what is the impact on the project of the deadlines for CPC commitment and disbursement not being met? Why is it important to community preservation? And what are the potential negative impacts to community preservation in not reviewing the process on an expedited basis? So, in, in that regard, I just want to follow up questions that might get to those if anyone has any major concerns. But assuming that it isn't treated this summer, the, the initial cutting, is it fair to assume that there's potential for that right when it needs to spread before the next round? I think it will indeed. It's, it's hard to estimate uh, just how much it will uh, increase, but I, I think there's no doubt that it will con continue to increase in that location. And if it were to I, increase, then it would be an additional An additional treatment. project, yeah. And you really only have one crack at it per year, and uh, so that's part of the problem. I would imagine if we don't fund this year, we may not be able to get this building by the end of the summer. <laughs> Yeah, the whole town will be locked down. I saw that movie. Yeah. I saw that movie. 22 stems to an acre in two years, an acre to a million acres in six months. I think, about that, I think that was Darwin's argument with Elvis. So was it? <laughs> Maybe I'm confusing if I might even know. Other, other questions along those lines? If there's no further discussion, all in favor of considering this for expedited review at our next meeting, say aye. Aye. Okay, opposed? Abstain? Okay, so that's unanimous to consider this for expedited review at the next meeting. Though. Okay, Any anything more that you need from me, or is that it? Um, yeah. I was only going to ask in terms of, maybe you should have asked this before we voted, but the, uh, in terms of your time frame and getting someone out there in June, what would be the start date so we can figure out whether or not if our next meeting, which is two weeks away, is too uh -huh. late for us to coordinate with the city council so we can bump that up for a break. And maybe part of that puzzle lies with Sarah, but part of it lies with you in terms right. of what you need to get out there. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not quite sure of the, uh, of, you know, how this <coughs> works going from the CPC to City Council, but uh, uh, Pollen would like to get in by the end of June to, to do the initial cutting of the stocks. Is that so we that would feasible? I mean we would be able to take this up at the twenty first, but unless we did a late file, it's not likely it would reach council until the beginning of June. They only meet twice a month, right? Yeah. Anyway, so that would be so, June fifth. So right, so June fifth, and then if they could do it in two readings, it would happen faster for such a small grant. But that's not necessarily set in stone. And then Sarah, once once it's done, how long will it take to move through the city city machinery? Uh, we need to approve a contract, which we could do at the meeting on the fourth. Let me ask you this: If the conservation commission was a co-applicant, would it speed the disbursement? I don't think it would matter. This is an issue with an expedited review, isn't it? It still takes two months. Yeah, it still takes time for to get through. And something like this, where time is really of the essence. Yes. And the only thing we could do is bump up our meeting time a little bit earlier meeting if that jives with the making an earlier uh, city council thing. I'm not sorry that reason I raised it. No, I don't they're on I think they're only I'll just check now. I think they're only meeting in May on the fifteenth. Does BBC have money to cover if but we can no, I know, but the BBC had money in their own budget. I mean, can you hire Poland to go and do it? But then it would be done. That's but that's done. Yeah, yeah, then you can right. pay retroactively. Yeah. If it could be reimbursed, the answer is yes, but I gather that it can't be. Yeah, they're, they're only meeting twice in May. Um, once on the 1st, which is combined, and then the 15th, and then June 5th is the next meeting. 
So how many days after June 5th, if, if we were to have a special meeting, a brief special meeting, between now and their next meeting in May, May 15th? What is the question? So the question is we're trying, the only, the only way it seems that we're going to do this in a timely fashion with the money dispersed to them. We, we couldn't. It, even at, unless we met next week and then convinced council to both okay. put it on the agenda as a very late file and then vote twice on it. Okay. How many days after June 5th, if they take it as, if they take two readings, does the city machinery take to generate a check? If, well, it wouldn't be the check, it would be the, the contract. Right. So if we had already approved the contract and had it ready to go, I could send it around the city on the 6th. And how long would it take? Assuming everyone is here and not on vacation, it's probably no more than a week. Oh, that's not bad. But that's two readings in the same session as city council. Yes. Is that really awkward to us? Uh, only if it's a late file. Generally, with expedited projects, they've been supportive. Okay. So for the twenty-four hundred dollars. So I can speak to the chair of the city council. That's I think that's the best we can do as far as moving it forward quickly. I have a confusing point to make. What are we asking Robert Brook to do between now and the next meeting of our, of our Well, they have to come forward with an expedited application. So we, you know, we need so we need an application which would specify, you know, the contract that you know we've we've seen Politan before used as a contractor, but you know the specific area, maybe a, you know printout of where it is, expectations. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, don't you have a copy of the application? I, Bob, I didn't send it because the committee didn't approve considering this as an I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You just now have <laughs> to listen to it. Okay. <laughs> Can I leave you a copy? I wrote yeah, a copy. Sure. sure. And, on, and it's already been submitted. So okay. Yeah. Um, then it's already been submitted. I see. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, yeah. I just thought. Yeah, yeah, no, I just assumed that you had some. And we are not so allowed to, to review the. <laughs> we can't look at the application now. That would mostly just be a public notice issue. Right. Because so it wasn't on the agenda. Okay, thank you. So, I think we can review this without Bob being present. And if we have further questions. Um, after you've reviewed it, if you think that it would be helpful to have Bob or someone from Rob Brook, let me know and I will get in touch with Bob. Otherwise, I think that we can go with the written application at our next meeting, whether to approve it or not. And if the committee has questions, they can also submit them to you by email. Right. And I'll forward them to Sean. Okay. Sure. That's fine. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, um, we'll see that again in a couple of weeks. And the next item is um, funding around debriefing. So, um, this again is your thoughts on the last funding round, any things that irked you, any things that pleased you, any modifications to the procedure. I think we're, we've still been trying to pin down getting the conditions done in a timely but thoughtful manner. I think that I've heard that having the resolutions drafted was helpful. And I would expect that we would go forward with that. Any other input on the procedure? I mean, the conditions beforehand was very good. Anything else? I, I have a, a general question uh, because we, an awful lot of the money we, we spend goes to something that I would soft spot for, which is affordable housing. Um, and I certainly voted to, to support all of the projects uh, that came before us in that category. And, and at the same time, I also want to make sure. I mean, I have a sense that there's, it's an endless bucket, a the, the bottomless bucket, that <clears throat> finding low, low-priced housing in in Northampton um, is something that would be highly desirable to a very large number of people throughout the Pioneer Valley and beyond, and so that there's no shortage of, there will never be a shortage of need if if the product we're offering is is supported housing. So I wonder, so clearly the, the 
I mean, I, I think that's, that's pretty much true on the space. And anybody who would like to live in the valley would like to live probably not far from here. And um, because it's, it's, a, it's a highly considered a highly desirable community, we've heard nothing but comments about how there's a shortage of, of such housing. Um, and my, since we're a taxpayer-supported enterprise of, uh, from here in Northampton, I guess I do have a concern that we, we keep a regular check on <coughs> ensuring that Northampton is, is, is meeting its uh, state-mandated needs for supporting um, low and moderate income housing, uh, and then some, hopefully, uh, but that this is not necessarily an endless um, activity because it has it does have an impact on affordability of housing for for all housing that's not moderate um, and tax affordable uh, housing. So um, it would be a matter of, of I guess keeping track, of having guide, having Sarah guide us or council mm -hmm. and planning guide us on. Um, just for give us, giving us a, a scorecard on how we're doing, and, and if we're if we're not keeping up to what the state says we should do, then we should you know, take it up a notch and provide more. But if we're if we're providing far more than what the state guidelines indicate, then then we should say, well, who who is it? And we, you know, if we look at where these people are coming from, are we providing better housing for people who are Northamptonites, or perhaps uh, providing uh, housing um, at the, at the Expense of Northampton taxpayers uh, for people who previously never lived here, um, and which is which it might be all right, but it's something we should at least have as a as a matter of discussion, um, uh, because it is our tax dollars that are that are that are relevant to it. It's not it's not a uh, any consequential matter. Um, so I I appreciate if we could get something that we haven't always had, which was kind of a, a status update on where we're. How Northampton is doing the scorecard um, as part of, of the, um, uh, the process of looking at, at um, uh, low and moderate income housing. That I please I hope no one takes that as in any way in any kind of negativity towards it. As I've said initially, and I'm a I, I, big supporter of it. Have, have always voted for it. I just want to make sure that that we're that we're keeping an eye on on how we're doing. Okay. We certainly. That's the housing partnerships. That's their brief, and so we certainly could have them give us their thoughts as well as you know, planning sustainability. We know where we fall as to Chapter 40, so we have both of those pieces. I think that's a readily knowable number. Yes, that that I know is, is tracked um, very carefully. But as to the wider question of how are we doing and meeting our needs, we did have a few years ago the housing partnership gave us their strategic plan. Um, and we can basically ask them to give us a status update on where we move forward. Um, the other thing that might be interesting to hear is there are um, some large community housing projects that are now in the works, and it might be interesting to get an update. For instance, I'm sure you see John CBC is trying to acquire, or they acquired the Northampton Lumber site and trying to work with development for that. So, any other thoughts? Other thoughts on the process? All right, hearing none, um, the next item on the agenda is to approve the contracts and the MOU for the projects that were just approved by council. All right, there's one request in that regard. I mean, you know, Sarah, you work for a number of different boards, so it's hard to do everything for everyone all the time. But I think we got things just yesterday. So it's kind of hard to give it a careful review. And I think we're familiar with a lot of the standard language, but it's hard to know if there's new stuff that's been added in and take the time to um, thoughtfully look at these and offer any suggestions. And sure. So, I mean, I'm happy to go through them. I think one thing that might help in the future is it's going to be towards the later part. I mean, it might be helpful if we can get them the Friday before or something so we have the weekend. So if it's going to be closer to the day before, if there's something that differentiate the standard language from anything that's new that's project specific so that we can focus on that. Uh, sure. Right the timing was kind of tough with this one just because they were only approved by council on Thursday. I understand. Oh, I'm not, but it's not a critique or indictment or I'm just trying to make it easier for everyone to feel comfortable because I think this is the part of the process that we all feel 
I mean, we are accountable for this part of approval, implementation, and holding people's feet to the fire. But if we don't have a chance to feel comfortable with it and get involved in it, then we lose our ownership over it. After a council has voted, we can still change conditions? We can. I'm mean, part of the discussion this round was to put the the bigger conditions right in the council orders, but smaller things like timing of reporting or placement of signage or something like that can be included in contracts and MOU. So we can modify the standard contract consistent with the resolution. <coughs> Sir, in that case, is there are there any of these projects that would be if we're look at these tonight? Are there any of these projects that would be disadvantaged by delaying a final vote on contract language until our next meeting? The only one that I've heard from that would really like to get going immediately is Bridge Street School. Okay. Because there's if that's the case, then we don't need to act on all of the contracts taking Dave's point into consideration. Focus on the Bridge Street School contract. Vote that tonight. That's in the interest of getting work done during the summer and getting it completed before school starts in the fall. And then we could put the other on the agenda for the next meeting. Is that acceptable? And we can yes. do that. So why don't we start with the playground we have then? So everything on the first two pages is standard for all CPA projects. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then the the conditions specific to the playground rehab project were so copied the, verbatim from the order. These two the bar over for the. So this is exactly what was written in the council order. Surface. 
I would think that if I was the Bridge Street principal, that I would make very sure that my staff, that they're my main staff, or if I'm working with DBW, I wouldn't, I wouldn't consider that they would. Well, I have the, the vision of these trucks that go in and out of the survival <coughs> cell. Right. <laughs> right. Well, well so, snow removal. But I think you only get to that if you pile, if you push all the snow from the parking lot onto the blacktop area. That's, okay. I think that's the, that's what we're trying to avoid, having them do that. This does not actually require them to remove the snow from the playground area. Right. It only says you can't use yeah. the playground area as a snow storage location. Right. Can we? So if you really want to affirmatively say you need to remove the snow from the playground location, yeah. well, I guess if they are, when we discussed this, I thought that our concern was that they not damage the playground by using the historic snow location. Now, whether or not they, it's their judgment that they remove snow from the rubberized area, I would leave that to the school to manage, you know, what's in the best interest of their, you know, if their students like playing in snow on top of the rubberized and it's a six inch snowfall, they don't, you know, I wouldn't require them to change their management. I wouldn't get into micromanaging. It's just, we don't want them to damage the capital investment. That, that's what I thought. Right? I, I agree with that. I thought that the discussion had gone beyond that. Yeah. Mr. Maybe we should change it to say it'd be required to find the snow storage location other than the playground and basketball court to ensure that snow removal will not damage those features. The, and we'll make it usable for up year. Couldn't we maybe just ask them to have a plan um, for s so that they would write what they what they would do? Um, I don't know. This seems like it's micromanagement to me. Maybe ask ask them to address the problem through. Or identify the problems. Before we get to my own discussion, I would say two basketball courts to ensure that those areas are not damaged. My only concern about having the plan, I mean, it would be if, if we did the plan, having a plan doesn't actually mean that they're going to implement the plan. So it would have to be the question is, is it a plan? Is it approved? Can we approve it? Can we enforce it? This way, is it, they don't do it, they're in violation of the contract, right? As opposed to the plan. Right. Um, true. And again, you know, one of the things we've always talked about is if they're in violation of the contract, then we have to task the solicitor with writing them a letter that you sued against them for violating the contract, um, which we've never done. So kind of would rather have them, again, since we are we now have another school group that's bringing forward an application for rehabilitation. Um, I guess one thing that, that I'm a little bit concerned about here is that, again, going to the focus of what are, what are we doing with this, kids in... My, you know, my kids like to play on snow. I actually pile all of the snow in my driveway up into a big pile because the kids like to slide on the pile of snow. That's been one of the things. The kids have always played on the snow piles. And so by saying you've got to take all the snow away, you're actually taking away this part of their environment that they sort of have thought of as a blue thing. Um, if you just, then you're saying, yes, it must be flat concrete all through the winter. And I'm not sure that that was, again, that my recollection is that was not our focus. Our focus was they can pile the snow at the edge of the area so the kids can play in it and it's available to them, but it's not damaging the road rise surface, then that's okay because, again, that's not damaging the resource. I didn't, 
this seems more like we're keeping it, making it a snow-free zone. So if you were to just say the school department will be required to find a snow storage location that does not damage right, which is where ground or basketball court, period, and then they can make their judgment as to whether piling it on the edge does that's right. And that's where we, I mean, where we started. The school department would require to find a snow storage location that will not damage the playground, and that will make it usable throughout the year. Right. So I thought that was well to make it usable throughout the year implies some kind of snow removal. Well, but it's using climb, climbing on snow piles though, right? Is using the playground. I mean, it, I it, but it's never going to be. I think that's used. unclear. I'm not sure what you're adding by those words other than. So we just required, I mean, if we're just focused on preventing damage, we can just say they'll be required to find a new snow storage location or a snow storage location that will not damage the playground or basketball court. Have they been using that as a snow storage location? Yes. Um, yeah, they were in February when they had their first meeting, and you're right, there were kids all over it. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, and again, you know, it wasn't an issue before because they had dirt, and so they just said, let's just push it onto the concrete and the dirt. The kids are not going to be allowed to play once there's ice on the playground. You know, once there's ice on the concrete surface, they're not going to be able to play on there anyway because they'll slip and fall on the concrete. So they just, as is most places, snow storage is convenience. It's not. There's not usually a well thought out plan. So. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean to me, the, the only real distinction is the way this is written now and the way it was originally written leaves them the discretion to pile it up on those areas and tell us, oh, it's not going to damage it. Well, that's why As I... As opposed to saying, you need to find a location other than it because when you've been doing it and we know they're putting it there, it's a cost problem. That's why I actually like um, Marlene's suggestion of them submitting a plan to us because Conservation Commission, when we have a snow storage issue where historically snow has been pushed toward a wetland, we say, we need a plan. And that at least requires them to go through the thinking of what are we going to do with this? And to consult with central services to figure out where is it going to go. Otherwise, nobody's going to think about this until the first big snowfall. And then they're going to be rushing around trying to clear areas and they'll say, eh, let's just push it over there, it's only six inches. And then the next snowfall comes and they'll do the same thing. So I mean I I would like it if they came to us and said we're now going to use, you know, because they have to at some point, they have to affirmatively identify where it should go. Why not do it now? Why not do it over the summer when the pace is a little bit slow? And again, then, then it will be easy enough for any of us to go by the school during the winter and say, oh, your snow storage plan says that the snow will be off-site, but there it is. Or you require a big question that is, to say that we'll do both. Just add this, add a requirement, and then say the school department will submit a plan to the community preservation committee. Yeah, I guess my point is I don't think that they should be storing snow on top of the areas that we were, we were refurbishing. That, that was the basis of my, my vote. You're saying even even the not only they should be piling, I mean, we're paying $90,000 to have this stuff resurfaced with rubber. No, no, but I'm saying, no, no, I, I agree with that, but I'm saying that the, if that's not what it the, there is the third surface, though, that is the basketball court that is not rubber. The basketball court's right. Black and I don't think that should, you know, when we can be retaking the basketball court, we shouldn't be putting a bunch of snow on it either. The snow is heavy. It bends, it gets into places, it cracks things. It just doesn't make any sense. To me. That was the objection in the first place of having it on top of it, and one of the reasons why it needs to be resurfaced. So, I thought that would be great. We can have them make a plan, and then they... you all got Amy. I mean, they they came to us for money to redo their their playground. Great proposal, a lot of public support. I voted for it. I do it a million times. We're we're telling them what to do with their snow removal. We have very competent people running that school. DPW is smart people. I just think we. We can go around, but we're, we're telling them what to do with their with their snow. I mean, we, we might as well be telling them how to mow the grass. I, I, I just don't, I don't think it's, it's, it's necessary. It could be within our purview, but it's really not necessary for us to get down to the level of telling them how to remove their snow. I just don't, I, I think they're competent people. They're, they're, they're totally entrusted by the city, highly licensed, totally supervised community boards. I just think that they can handle it. So I, 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 my, my, to be 
to the procedure about this, I uh, um, don't think that we have to have a section in there about snow removal. Okay, so we have the language um, for snow storage. Just wanted to, just to move on to, we can come back to it, but I want to move on to crosswalk maintenance. Do we think that that language is acceptable? No comments on that. The Recreation Department coordination, do we find that acceptable? I would recommend changing it in its effort to design and install complementary improvements so that it's clear that it should be coordinating with four things going on. Is the definition of the lawyer, or the definition of its, in the third word on the last line, refer to the city's department of parks and recreation? Yes. Or to refer to the school department? That would be department. That would be the rec department. Okay. So would someone move the language, and then if we wish to make amendments, we can go through those amendments. If someone wants to move this contract language. I vote to move the contract. Okay. Is there a second to that motion? Okay. Now that we've got this version up, discussion on this specific version, any amendments to it that you propose? Is, is that motion dealing with the general standard contract language or only the conditions? We're only, dealing with, questions okay, we're only dealing right now with that condition. to say the school department will be required to find a, a snow storage location other than the playground and the basketball court to ensure that these features will not be these features will not be damaged. Yeah. And if we want to add in something about the plan for them to come before us, we can do that afterwards. Okay, second for the amendment. Discussion on the amendment. Yeah, I'm going to vote against the amendment just because I think that if if you can show me that you can snow, you can put snow on the basketball court and it won't damage it, and you know you can leave snow piles. I understand snow is heavy, but I just don't think that making that snow free zone is necessarily in keeping with the best interests of making an active, engaging play area. So I'll vote against the amendment. Um, there's no further discussion. All vote on the amendment. All in favor of the amendment, say aye. Okay, opposed? Okay, the amendment fails. So we're back to the original language, which just requires them to find a snow storage location that will not damage the playground and basketball court. All right, further discussion on amendments. All right. All in favor of this language for the specific conditions, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Two opposed. Rest voting in favor. Any abstentions? All right. So now, um, we put that language, we can look at the general contract language. Um, yeah, I'm a newbie, so some of this is just trying to sort through and, and make some sense of it. Um, So I one one question I had is, is is there a time frame to these obligations? Is there ever I mean these conditions seem to exist for all time or is there a period after which they they are free of them or 
um, they are... Because some of these are ongoing obligations. Right, some of them are ongoing obligations, for instance, um, you know, keeping the sign displayed, or in this case, the snow storage would survive. Um, but, and obviously some of them are limited to three years of the contract. Now, of course, we're limited in our remedies after, in terms of an ongoing obligation, because we have no real leverage. Right. Once, once the project is completed and they've spent the money, um, it would be hard for us to then go to a school department or go to any applicant and try to recover um, damages for their failure to live up to the covenant. But that's one of the things that a long time ago when we looked at enforcement powers, um, we signed these agreements and while we hold the, hold the money, we have some power that we usually can aggressively enforce their failure to live up to one of the covenants. But after that, continuing conditions, we have no movement. Is that simply as a practical matter? Yeah, I think so. We don't. We could, you know, we have administrative funds. We could hire an attorney to pursue someone uh, if we found out, for instance, they weren't keeping up something that they had obliged themselves to. But we've never. Uh, and I guess I'm asking that because it's not clear to me. Let me, let me go through my various questions. There's a reference in, to, in the sixth paragraph to a scope of services. And I'm, I mean, usually when you have a scope of services in a contract, that's a defined term, there's a particular, it's a particular reference, and I'm not sure what that is a reference to. It's true. I mean, this is taken initially from the city's contract that they signed with outside contractors to provide services. Now, you could say that the services that are being provided are the design, and construction, rehabilitation, of the playground. And so that's, and you could modify the contract to say that that is, like you said, making a defined term. So services provided under this contract shall be, and we could modify that clause, uh, or we could say. The grantee shall use the funds for design construction costs to rehabilitate you know, here and after scope of services if you wanted to make that specific. Now, as far as the delegation, the sign, or transfer, um, again, I don't know, Sarah, how have you ever enforced that particular clause? I've never had to. Do. I guess I'm not sure what it's trying to accomplish, though. It just doesn't seem to apply. What kinds of duties would the recipient be transferring to somebody else? Right. I don't think it would hurt just to take it out of this particular contract. I don't think there'd be any risk to the contract. Are we allowed to do this? Yeah, we have more leeway with these because they're MOU and not actual contracts. Mm -hmm. So if there's things that we don't like, we have. Definitely the power to change them. Maybe, maybe I should go through the rest of my comments mm -hmm. and then we can move okay. around. Um, I also did not really understand the final payment on the agreement uh, shall release and discharge the grantor from any and all claims against the grantor on account of any work performed here under. The grantor is not performing any work.
So again, I'm just I'm, I'm looking at this and thinking this is a uh, from the desire of the city to avoid municipal liability in connection with work with the contracted work. Um, and so I guess my thought would be if we want to change this language, I would feel more comfortable submitting it to Joe Cook mm -hmm. and saying, oh, yes, saying yes, yes, we'd yes. like to strike these. I don't. I don't think you would have any comments because this language will be duplicated in right. any contract that the school department signs with a contractor. Right. If if that weren't the case, then that would be an issue. But in this case, I think it's fine. So my question then would be: Do we? Do you feel that we are disadvantaged by having the boiler play in? And I know that you know typically you say, well, leaving boiler play in leaves ambiguity. If it doesn't apply, why is it there? But on the other hand, if we change the form contract, I mean, we could write the write them from scratch. We could strike them as we go through. But then again, not being municipal contract attorney, I don't know. You could definitely submit it to Joe and see whether he thinks it's okay. We could strike whatever you think mm -hmm. is not necessary. Mm -hmm. um, let me go to a slightly more substantive one. There was a discussion that this is really not a contract, but it says it's a contract in the second to the last paragraph. It's the Massachusetts contract and its interpretation of construction. So are we saying it's a contract? Are we saying it's not a contract? I think that clause is what gives the CPC some enforcement authority. And then it is a contract, and well, we should be saying, and, and then I think we should be saying it's it's a contract. But because it's between city agencies, it isn't technically a contract. That that I don't I don't know municipal law, so that that may be the case. But in the, this is the boilerplate, so it's also a city that's being used for non-city agencies. Maybe we could just change that word contract to agreement. And we'll see what, because that's, if it's not a contract, it's, it's an agreement. Right? What else could it be?
I'm not sure what the reference is to the guarantee restriction that's accepted by the Northampton CPC being incorporated into the grant agreement. Is there a specific guarantee restriction um, that the recipients know about? In this case, no. This if case it was a land acquisition project, or a historic preservation, then, yeah, then there would be. So we could strike that one in this case. Now, can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Where where did these contracts come from? That the M the MOU template is based off of the city contract, but there are a lot of clauses removed. This is much shorter than the, the standard contract. Because I I bet that there are forms in the law library or in the legal world for grant contracts, which might be you know more relevant and not have all this extra language in it. We have the law library over in the courthouse in the basement there, and the law library, and she, you could just walk in and say, do you have forms for a grant contracts? And she would uh, give you the book in five minutes. Uh, I remember when I first started, I had the same problem with the contracts. They, and then I just uh, stopped worrying about it. But it's a huge problem, I think. Well, I was going to let the three lawyers figure it out, but um, I want to make sure we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. I, I, we need a standard. Yeah, it's yes. going to have to be the very elaborate city solicitor blessed version. Yeah. And then if we haven't had any, I agree that with half of that could be thrown out for MOUs and, and between departments would be another case. That's what you use MOUs for, but. Um, have we had, I, I think the question is really, have we had any trouble with the clauses that are in there? That, no, that don't I don't apply? think we have to solve it today, but I think it would it would be great, you know, and I'd be willing to work with, um, I'm sorry, I Linda. Linda. You know, and maybe make it a long-term project, probably take a long time, but I'd feel good about leaving this committee and have, having accomplished that, to make some changes to the form, so. Uh, but I don't, what, there's no way we're going to solve the problem today. You know, so I agree with you. I, I don't think well, and I think as we get into the short project discussion and we start taking language like this and presenting it to people when they yeah. have just a request mm -hmm. for $1,000, then we are going to have to grapple with it at some point. Yeah. So I'll, I'll talk to the law librarian and I'll bring some in for us. It could be sort of just a long term project like the small projects and see what I can find out. So Sarah, I just have a question. I wasn't here when when this was begun, but there's no reference to contract in the statute. So the way it says that the CPC makes recommendations and that the legislative authority votes funding. So do you know why or whether it is common practice to have the CPC be, be the contracting authority? Uh, it is common practice. I don't know if every CPC does it that way. But just because one of the things that I see is that we're really signing as an agency of the city to a certain extent. We're not independent of the city, mm -hmm. um, which is why I feel a little bit like Devin. I don't want to, no one, no one's going to come after us specifically if a CPC project goes wrong and work, right, work on a historic project, damages their house, damages their car. They're going to come after the city. Uh, and so I think that's why I'd be interested in that, making sure that whatever contract we have is one, and then that's again, you know, the standard contract has the benefit of leaving in things if they're not harmful that may, you know, may in some unforeseen circumstances, benefit you. Um, again, I, I agree that if they're, if they're actually, uh, like that tax language doesn't make a lot of sense when you're talking about the school department uh, having personal commitment to pay taxes or hold taxes to the side if they're not paying their workers. Um, but we can either address these now or I think that it would be a wider question of how do we want to handle it? Are we handling contracts in the best way? Um, and can we handle them with shorter grant? Well, Marla, I can see where, you know, your background to would help with this, but I still think it's the city solicitor job to figure out what format we would be using, not ours. Yeah, mm -hmm. and being a government attorney, a lot of these things are developed as kind of 
one things get cut and pasted in the other as you right. develop templates and your common practice is based on years of history. And so I think there are reasons why they're in here. I think all your points are good and I think there are points that a number of us have raised at, at different times. I'm concerned about going to do kind of the library, library and looking at the treatise and pulling out a grant when that's not specific to our city needs. But I think it's worth having a discussion with either the contracting department or the city solicitor say, we would like to develop a template for our use in here yeah. the different parameters. We want one for individuals, one for entities, mm -hmm. one for MOUs, and this. Yeah. You'd say, here's your structure. Mm -hmm. Can you give us one that has the options of include this, don't include this, kind of like a toggle switch when we need to do it? Yeah. I think that would be a more productive conversation. I think through that, we can educate ourselves on how these things work. As you said, you know, from what's the other side's perspective and what are we actually asking people to commit to? Yeah. So I think even for lawyers, it's hard to understand what, what some of this language yeah. means. A lot of this legalese for people who aren't trained in that field to probably watch over when you look at it and just go to this specific condition. And that would just service to everybody. I'm just wondering, where did they come from? I, the first committee, I mean, who decided, you know, when the CPA first was formed, who came up with the contracts? So we didn't go over the contracts. So the, oh. the city has a standard contract. So um, oh. the city auditor, every few years, sends out the standard contract and said, here's our, our base template for contracting. Anytime we're dealing with funds over $5,000, you need to use this. And we've messed with it a little bit to take out things that really aren't applicable since we're we're giving money away and, and not really entering into contracts so much, but yeah. for the most part it's that standard template. Mm -hmm. I, I like the way you suggest about doing it. I, I was not thinking that we were going to recraft this document. I just part of it was to help my understanding of the part of it was to express that um, there, there does to be seem to be some looseness in the in the language, some of it, you know, is not particularly important, but, but um, uh, some of it, particularly around the guarantees, I think this does have some real implications as to what uh, what is being uh, put on these properties for, for how long. It could be approached, for instance, as a recoverable grant rather than as a contract. Maybe that would be more in keeping with people's understanding, but I think going about it the way you suggested is so would it be satisfactory to request of, of Joe Cook and the solicitor that they provide us with perhaps a, a narration of various clauses, why they're appropriate, why they should be retained, when they can be struck? I mean, I just, you know, I, I do not know municipal law well enough to have any sense of that. And I, like, my, my experience is that usually um, when you begin to, when you begin to pull out things, again, if it's a long-standing practice, that it may work, but sometimes it, it doesn't, if you don't know the practice area. So um, I, I would really, it would be nice to have a narrative so then we can establish whether some of these things are just extra privilege that don't make any sense. And then some of them, like the monitoring and guarantee clauses, are specific to the CPA. Uh, those were developed, I think, probably, it was before my time, but probably based on template language from the community. I, I guess I would approach it a little bit differently, because I'm not, maybe I'm misunderstanding, but it sounds to me like this was not really developed with CPA in mind. It went from a standard form to what do we think might be. You know what? What? What can we delete? But so, so keeping the, the standard form, which is different from saying, well, what's the best thing to do in this situation? You know, it's kind of a shortcut as opposed to maybe the best cut on how to how to structure the document. Yeah, it seems kind of sloppy to me. It's always seems kind of sloppy. I just. Uh, We could do it better. It would make sense to ask Alan Seawall to, to look at it. In fact, I, when I first came on the committee, I asked, I told him I, I thought the contracts were a problem. So I think uh, we need to address it with him. Well, the other thing that we can do is to ask 
the Community Preservation Coalition to provide us with specimen contracts from other municipalities. I mean, one of the things is the function of this to insulate the city from liability. Absolutely. That you know, I think that's that's what Joe Cook is interested in. He doesn't really care well, when we give away our money. Yeah, yeah. No. So, um, but if we if we can get specimen contracts from other municipalities, mm -hmm. like you said, there's a better way to do this for our tra for transparency, so that people want to read our contract, mm -hmm. it makes some sense that we can grab it. So that would be three people that will contact and try to get a report back for the committee. Okay, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. All right, so with those um, caveats in mind about the specific contract, or the general contract language and the specific uh, contract language already been voted on, I have a motion to approve the contract as amended. Can we approve the contract as amended? Is there a second? Further discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, unanimous vote for that. So I will work on all those things. I don't anticipate that we'll get a new contract developed in right. time for the, this funding round. Yeah. I think these are, I mean, unless we want to hold off, but some of our grantees might be angry at us if we do that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think the important thing is with a fresh set of eyes looking at this thing, does this make sense that? Um, we can have a process where we evaluate, is this the best model? Um, if it's not, you know, we're, what's required, what's not required, and especially if we're looking to a small grants uh, procedure, it will be much more troubling to an individual who's putting out their boxes oh, yeah. to have to guarantee, yeah. be on the hook for a guarantee for taxes forever. Uh, you <laughs> imagine the DOR would come to hunt them down, so. And that clause has come up before. Yeah. Um, there are instances where people were behind on water bills and taxes, and we pointed to the CPA and we said, you need to pay this, or we can't reimburse you anymore. Okay. All right. So in that case, we are then going to address the other contracts at our next meeting, which brings us to the sign for South Street. David has suggestions. Yes. There, there is some correction that you could make on it. Can you put it up, Sarah? Oh, yeah. I am. Who did the work for this one? Um, John and I put it together, but it was also taken heavily from the, the application and some other historic materials that we were able to find. So I just want to say, sitting in the, the chair seat, that Dave submitted changes. I thought of my own changes that were different from the original submission and Dave's changes. I see that you've got a markup and now Dave. So what I thought tonight is this could descend into writing by committee to hell. Um, <laughs> And there's no hurry with this so, at all. So this is all no hurry. The only thing I'm, I'm, I mean, I couldn't care less about the admitted comma, really, yes. but there, there's, some, <laughs> there's some factual errors on, on the write up. Okay. They do bother me. Go right at it. I was going to say that. Okay. Uh, the, the, the building was not damaged by heavy rains in October 1936, it was damaged by flooding in March of 1936. The city was inundated in the spring. Flood caused by uh, the entire northeast, so going from dead of winter to 70 degree weather in the space of one week. And uh, uh, water came, flooded provisions, and flooded well, certainly across the parking lot uh, to all the stores that were on the back, the, the back end, ground level of that building, Cookmont building. Um, Anyway, the, the storm is well documented, and it was March of 1936. Um, the Montana's the, first mayor used and is historically recorded as, as Benjamin E. Cook, Jr., um, and that's as per the historic Northampton website. Um, his father was senior and was another town worthy, but uh, it was Benjamin E. Cook, Jr., who was the first mayor. And yes, third, third line after the first word residential, there needs to be a uh,
David, I'm going to ask you. I'm looking at this headline, Labor to Save Sinking Northampton Block, dated October 19th, 1936. And there's guys with... Say what? There's, there's, in the application, there's a newspaper clipping from Monday, October 19th, 1936, Labor to Save the Sinking Northampton Block. It has guys with pumps. And it was from October. Yep, from October. Building sinks as foundation is undermined. I thought it was that it wasn't the heavy rains; it was the neglect of the municipal infrastructure. Because well, it was underwater. In March. Well, there was a surface. There was a surface sewer that had been blocked, or surface right water way that had been blocked, and that dumped it into the old sanitary sewer that had been abandoned, and that undermined the foundation. So that's and, what Okay. That's I'm sure the hurricane that previous well, time didn't I, I, do didn't much check for it. Well, I didn't to see whether they meant the hurricane, the fall hurricane of 38, and that was a, uh, September. But um, I stand corrected. I'm embarrassed. I did a web search for weather of 1936, and it didn't come up. I don't even know whether it was a big storm or whether it was just the fact that the... I think we could put this in the plug-in for DBW. This is what happens if you don't take care of your infrastructure. And given that, that a vast quantity of the, of the buildings in Northampton were heavily um, damaged by being underwater that March, it... But, um, but this building was not underwater. The, the, the other side of this, where it, it hits the parking lot, actually was underwater. Town below. Yes. But what we're looking at was not. No, but that's the, the foundation of that foundation building, but the back side was underwater. Was we assign our historic But I take your point. If you have the actual to, yeah. to redraft the factual stuff and get that to Sarah and then incorporate all of our comments in another version of the whole rest of it. That sounds like an outstanding. What? Sorry? I didn't hear. You just delegated to you, David. Would you, you a would you be willing to um, take the assorted comments? From, as our historic commission representative, take the assorted comments from the committee and using your corrections to the factual I, parts. To which I contributed only at a man's junior status because you obviously had no, no, I, no, I, 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 I was saying, I mean, you have the original source, dude, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with yours. No, no, but I'm saying, would you like to draft a new, a new version so that we can. Is there. Oh, I, I'm sorry. And, and, and you have as you would have the committee wants, that, but is there any reason? Is there. While we have the committee in front of us, around us, is there any substantial change? Uh, we're not going to change the October 36 comment. Uh, that is a, that was accurate, um, and we have a comment for residential. If just just to guide me in case I do this, is there any impact? Any request for substantial? Change from this because it seems like the feeling is accurate now. Well, I, I submitted my comments already to Sarah Downing and his comments. And we, we had a few, so I didn't. I didn't want to mesh off the other stuff. So this is oh, okay. Little, right. So the only question really was: Is it heavy rains, or was it something else in October 1936? And did your hurricane or whatever happened in the It wasn't a yeah, it hurricane. It was a flood. Yeah. You could just say in October 1936. And not or in 1936. In 1936. <laughs> right. But that would be the point, is that you can make those decisions as our historic person, so that we don't have to debate that, not knowing what really happened. If you're willing to accept that challenge. Hey, Dan, can you send me the uh, clipping? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Because if I take it back to the historic commission, I'm sure someone, someone else would likely make the same error I did and assume that it was uh, the flooding that did the damage and not, not some sort of a... Um, infrastructure problems. Well, and I guess since you know, since this is going to be a plaque on a historic building, I would think that having the historic commission, sure, you are experts in commemorating. No, and our no, our commission, we can spend. We'd be delighted to spend hours on. This. I will delegate to your committee. <laughs> so, if you would like to accept that, then we will do that. And you yes. can bring it back to us. Words so with it. It will, you will make it fit on a nice brass plaque and. Shorter is better. Well, now, will this have the, the plaque won't have an image on it? We were trying to see if it could, or at least Isn't it some going part to be of it. Plaque near the building itself? 
It will be on it. Yeah. That's that's not. But you see that actually quite a bit. That plaques on buildings will have at least a relief of what the building looks like. I don't. We don't have to do it that way. Go for it. So delegate. So and, and you'll you'll send me copies of all of the suggested yes. changes. Yes, I will do that. Uh, and at long last, the last item on the agenda is a request for support of a bond bill authorizing courthouse repairs. The backstory: a number of cycles ago, we um, we recommended and city council approved money for repair of the courthouse steps, um, which was a small part of a much larger repair so, project. So I left this committee's letter on my desk, but the wording is identical. Uh, this was a request of the Historical Commission, so the Council of Governments would like us to write a letter to uh, the Chairman of the House Committee on Bonding, Capital Expenditures, and State Assets asking for approval of HB 3690, Section 2, which would authorize $4 million to repair the Hampshire County Court. Wow. This might not have actually turn into real money, just because something is in a bond bill doesn't mean it. Just because it was. It doesn't mean it will turn into real money, even if the bond bill passes, but, it, but it's in there anyway. Four million cover the entire cost of the renovation that we're seeking to do? Yeah. Did they do the step? Not yet. No. They had a lot of matching Progress. funds that they needed first. So we are being asked to resolve ourselves in support and send a similar letter. And the Historic Commission did approve this letter as well. Based on the fact that we had funded this building previously, I think we can do nothing more than say we support a bond bill authorizing courthouse repairs. Okay. Is there a second? Yeah, okay. Second by Dave. All in favor? Unanimous. All right. There's no business that could not be anticipated. Motion to adjourn. Second. Yeah. All there.